probably thought for a long time that if you lose weight, you'll likely be healthier for it. I'm right there with you. That was my impression too. However, apparently we've all been lied to. Nah, it isn't that serious, but there is some context that needs to be applied to the situation according to this study, investigating the issue of weight loss and cardiovascular disease. People who lost weight had more heart attacks, strokes, and overall cardiovascular attributed deaths. Now, before you throw your hands up and say, one day they say this, one day they say that, what's next? Smoking is good for us? Come on, get out of here. Get out of here. <laughs> I think you'll end up realizing that the contents of this study make a lot of sense. Correct me if I'm wrong. Okay, so the researchers took data from a randomized control trial that lasted for a number of years, as well as follow-up data from a decade later in almost 500 participants, and quantified the number of people who had any kind of cardiovascular disease event, called a stroke or a heart attack or just plain old death, and the participants were then placed into three groups, a weight gain condition, abbreviated WG, when we look at the data, a weight loss condition, abbreviated WLML, and another weight loss condition, abbreviated WLMG. I'll explain the distinction between the two weight loss conditions in a minute. First, let me show you what happened to these people. If we open the data up, we see what's known as a Kaplan-Meier curve. There's a lot of these when looking at the death rate of my during animal research, but here we're looking at humans. A bit gruesome, but this curve is showing the number of people that are free of cardiovascular disease events over a decade. To be clear, they have not experienced a heart attack or stroke or related death. So the vertical axis indicates the number of people as a ratio who are cardiovascular disease outcome free. The horizontal line is the length of time. If the lines dip down, that means that people in that group are no longer symptom free. As a reminder, WG is the weight gain group. The WL groups are the weight loss groups. And notice uh, anything odd there? Of course you do. You're a perceptive person. The lines don't look the same. Two of them overlap and seem to indicate similar poor results. Fewer people are symptom free. The one group is higher up with fewer incidents. So we have the weight gain group doing worse and one of the weight loss conditions doing worse. Okay, that's a bit weird, right? I mean, we'd expect that the weight gain group would do worse, but what's up with the weight loss group? Well, the distinction between the two is the second part, the MG and the ML part. They stand for muscle gain and muscle loss. As you can see, the weight loss plus muscle loss leads to worse outcomes, and the weight loss and muscle gain leads to better outcomes. But there are some nuances to pick out here that I think are extremely important. Before we get to those, let me show you one more piece of data. The researchers offer us a sigmoidal graph that indicates the two major players of risk. In brief, the vertical axis is the amount of risk. If the red line goes up, it means that there's increased risk, with one being standard risk. The horizontal axis, however, is the ratio between skeletal muscle mass change and weight change. So for for example, if there is a smaller muscle mass, a greater change, then the risk shifts to the right and upward. Or if weight loss occurs and muscle mass changes occur, remember that's loss, then the line moves to the right, indicating greater risk. What's interesting about this data is that this data is also adjusted for sex, age, starting weight, race, previous cardiovascular disease, smoking, blood sugar, physical function, blood pressure, and a few other potential confounding variables, which are variables that might be the true causes of this change in risk. So it lends greater credence to the idea that it is due to weight loss and or muscle loss. But as I mentioned, there are some key nuances to keep in mind. Among the ones that I'd like to get into is if this also applies to maintaining weight, including the loss and gain of muscle. And if gaining weight, but also gaining muscle has similar effects like many of us experience. I'll be covering those aspects in my extended version of this video in the Physionic Insiders. If you're interested in having access to the full version of all these analyses to improve your well-being and health, be sure to consider joining. The link is below. I'd really love to have you aboard. 
But aside from that, there are a number of other aspects to keep in mind. Like the fact that while the analysis was in a randomized controlled trial initially, and the three groups analyzed did stem from that trial, the follow-up data is associative, considering it was performed a decade later. Additionally, consider that the people who maintained or gained muscle with weight loss were likely the group exercising throughout the trial and continued to exercise after the initial four years. So was the improvement due to the muscle or due to the exercise or both? Well, if you remember, I mentioned earlier that the researchers did adjust for physical function, but I had difficulty really determining exactly what that meant. Was it uh, a test like a sit to stand test or was it exercising or I don't know, something else? It wasn't clear, but clearly some level of adjustment was performed. Still, it seems to me that the exercise could be a major confounding variable here. I'll address that more in a second. One additional consideration is that the analysis was in obese and diabetic individuals. So while the applicability to daily life is high, would this also apply to non-overweight individuals? I'd venture to say yes, but there's no data here to actually back that up. Anyway, these are some important acknowledgements, but the researchers address some of these concerns themselves. For example, they point out counterintuitively that there are studies indicating that if two people have heart disease, the one who weighs more has better heart disease outcomes. <laughs> I would push back and say that there are many possibilities why that's the case, but they argue it's likely because overweight individuals maintain muscle mass better due to the weight that's put on their skeleton. It is true that whole body muscle mass is higher in obese individuals, but it still misses a lot of context that I wouldn't feel comfortable jumping to that conclusion. So where does that leave us? Well, the analysis is fascinating, but I think I would go more conservative on the conclusions drawn here compared to what the researchers seem to argue, because there isn't enough of a distinction between exercise and muscle mass. If any, if we're being honest, I would interpret this data this way. There's a link between maintaining or gaining muscle while undergoing weight loss that indicates a protective effect against cardiovascular conditions compared to weight loss with muscle loss and weight gain. Weight loss may still be superior regardless of the type to weight gain, but that's far less clear. Obviously, exercise is the most potent driver of muscle maintenance and growth, but muscle has many physiological effects on our heart and artery health in its own right. But you want solutions. So I'd encourage that you check out this video right here, which goes into several tips on how to maintain your muscle mass and function as you lose weight. I'll see you over there.